Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode number 39 of History for Shut-Ins. Today, we are going to talk about the presidency of Andrew Johnson, including his impeachment. And then next week, we will tie up loose ends from Johnson's presidency and talk about the presidency of USSS Grant. One other note, tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern, I will be giving a talk on Marple Public Library's Facebook page on the Roaring 1920s. I hope you can join me then. Lincoln, who was uncertain about his election, his re-election in 1864, tried to balance the ticket by convincing Republican delegates to their National Union Convention to drop Hannibal Hamlin of Missouri as vice president in favor of Andrew Johnson, who was the most prominent war Democrat in America at the time. Moderate Republicans eagerly supported Johnson, who was known for his tough stand against the planter aristocracy, the Confederacy, although Hamlin lobbied hard to retain his place on the ticket. At his party's national convention in Baltimore, in, on June 4th, Lincoln relied on Tennessee's convention delegates to publicly make the case for Johnson. They did with stirring speeches that praised Johnson for having stood loyal while, quote, in the very furnace of the rebellion, unquote, as a Tennessean. Lincoln's backers in the North delighted in contrasting Johnson's rock ribbed loyalty to the Union with the less admirable record of McClellan's running mate, George H. Pendleton of Ohio. Pendleton was the personification of what was known at the time as a Copperhead Democrat. Copperheads wanted to make a peace settlement with the Confederacy. Johnson also strengthened Lincoln's appeal to the Union's working class, especially the immigrant Irish. Irish Catholic voters favored Johnson for his strong record against anti-Catholicism while Johnson was governor of Tennessee. Johnson was also widely recognized as a champion of America's what were called yeoman Democrats small farmers and village artisans everywhere in the Union. There were some radical Republicans who felt differently. Some called for a convention in Cleveland, which actually took place, and they nominated John C. Fremont. Remember, Fremont was the first Republican candidate for president back in 1856. They also called for General John Cochran as the vice president. With Johnson on the ticket, Lincoln was strengthened with moderates, even as he lost support from the right wing of his party. The Lincoln-Johnson ticket, opposed by Democratic candidates George B. McClellan and Pendleton, went into the election with several advantages. Most Republicans supported Lincoln and his determination to win the war, not just settle for peace. Most Union soldiers also supported that, even though McClellan was still popular with many of the Union ranks. McClellan rejected the peace plank of his own party platform, which called for immediate cessation of hostilities and restoration of peace, quote, on the basis of the Federal Union of States, unquote. Most importantly, when William Tecumseh Sherman successfully marched through Georgia in September of 1864 and delivers Atlanta to the Union, the sentiment for Lincoln united the party behind him. Lincoln was reelected in a landslide. He acquired 10 times the electoral votes of McClellan. A few hours after Lincoln's death, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Salmon Chase, swore Johnson in as president. 
Republicans were relieved that Johnson could provide continuity. They thought that he would follow the dictates of Republican congressional leaders. Although Johnson came into the presidency with much political and administrative experience, the task confronting him would require extraordinary talents of leadership that Johnson, quite frankly, had yet to exhibit. Most immediate was the question of what to do with the defeated Confederate states. What rights would be granted to the four million former slaves and what punishment, if any, would be applied to supporters of the Confederacy? The morning of Lincoln's assassination, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton presented to the cabinet the outlines of a reconstruction program. The program would impose military rule and stiff conditions upon the defeated Confederate states for the restoration to the Union. This was a substantial difference or modification from Lincoln's earlier stand urging a quick return to equal status with few conditions beyond oaths of loyalty and abolishment of slavery. Although Lincoln favored granting voting rights to black men with property and education, he had not been prepared to force the issue, which aroused intense opposition and concern among radical Republicans. In the minds of most Republicans, there were three related problems to Lincoln's easy, no strings attached post war policy toward the Confederate states. First, the defeated states would certainly take advantage of the freed slaves to impose racial strictures and labor conditions that would keep intact, pardon me, keep intact the economic and political power of the old planter class. This would enable the South to continue its obstructionist role in Congress and opposition to federal programs benefiting industrial and Western interests. Second, unless Southern Blacks were enfranchised and Confederate leaders disfranchised, a United Democratic Party might win the congressional elections in 1866 and run and elect someone like Robert E. Lee for the presidency in 1868. As a new party, Republicans understood how fragile their hold on the government was. In a fully restored union, the black vote was considered essential to continued Republican control of the presidency and Congress. Third, the presence of black soldiers stationed in southern states, the intense expectations of the former slaves for full civil rights and demands of abolitionist reformers for racial equality could not be ignored easily. We're still having these conversations today. At first, many radical Republicans assumed that Jackson shared their broad, expansive concept of federal power and their commitment to political equality for blacks. Although a strong union man, Johnson had always believed in strict construction of the Constitution and states' rights, which did not include the rights of secession. He followed Lincoln's earlier reasoning that while individual traitors should be punished, the states had never legally left the Union nor surrendered their rights to govern their own affairs. He echoed Lincoln's view that 600,000 dead soldiers determined the issue that the South had been unable to leave the Union. So how could the Southern states be treated as if they had? This is Johnson's argument. In his mind, Johnson believes the issue of what to do with the defeated Southern states was simple. 
impose conditions upon their return to full standing, such as the irrevocable abolition of slavery written into their state constitutions and loyalty oaths as a condition of suffrage, but do not impose black suffrage as a condition of readmission. From April of 1865 through December of 1865, questions of Reconstruction were almost totally in the hands of Andrew Johnson because Congress had recessed shortly before he took the oath of office and did not reconvene until December of 1865. In those eight months, Johnson rushed to implement his own reconstruction policies based upon his interpretation of Lincoln's program. He appointed provisional governors to the defeated states and required them to call special conventions to draft new constitutions that abolished slavery and renounced secession. After the ratification of these constitutions, newly elected governments were to send representatives to Congress and the states thereby would be restored to the Union. According to Johnson's program, every Southern voter would have to swear an oath of loyalty to obtain amnesty or to be pardoned. Several classes of Southerners were not to be given amnesty, according to Johnson's plan. First, former federal officials who supported the Confederacy. Second, graduates of the military academies at West Point or Annapolis who served with the Confederacy during the war. Third, high-ranking Confederate officers and political leaders. And fourth, all individuals who had aided the rebellion and who owned taxable property valued at greater than $20,000. So he's looking at the planters, plantation owners. Individuals who fell into these four categories had to apply personally to Johnson for pardon and restoration of their political rights. During the summer of 1865, white residents of every Southern state worked to abide by Johnson's program to be ready to take seats in Congress upon its reconvening in December of 1865. Surprisingly, Johnson actually hands out thousands upon thousands of pardons, enabling most members of the old planter class and many Confederate leaders to reemerge in power on the state level. There are numerous questions why Johnson basically does this after saying he's going to be very hard line. The thought, number one, underlying is Johnson's racism. His pleasure also taken in having the planner class come before him on bended knee to receive their pardons. His commitment to states' rights his desire to build a new electoral constituency comprised of conservative Democrats and Republicans for a presidential bid in 1868, and his belief that if African American men were granted the vote, planters would control their votes and the middling white man would continue to be marginalized. Again, the yeoman as we had mentioned earlier. In the rush to re-enter the Union, some state conventions refused to reject secession and Confederate debt. Almost all of these states imposed severe laws that limited the freedom of former slaves. These were known as Black Codes. These laws required, with variations by state, former slaves to carry permits whenever they were off their old plantations, to observe curfews in town and to have signed contracts of employment by the end of January 1866 or be arrested as vagrants. 
These codes were designed to force the former slaves into a slave-like employment status on the plantations. Each youth was required to be apprenticed to an employer who could exercise parental authority over their wards. According to law, parental permission was not required. In many cases, the courts bound young men and women in their 20s as apprentices. Some state conventions disallowed the former slaves to own or rent farms, rights to hunt, carry firearms, fish, or freely graze livestock were typically revoked for blacks. Most state-supported institutions, such as schools or orphanages, excluded blacks. Not surprisingly, when Congress reconvened in December of 1865, the Republican majority established a Joint Committee of Reconstruction to examine Johnson's policies and voted not to admit the newly elected Southern representatives or to recognize the newly reestablished state governments as valid. Thereafter, Congress and Johnson clashed continually over the next two years. Republican membership in Congress united in support of a military reconstruction program that would guarantee political and civil rights for Southern blacks. Johnson aided this party unity by his heavy handed efforts to block black suffrage and congressional programs that he considered a usurpation of his presidential authority. When Congress passed an extension of the Freedmen's Bureau in February of 1866, most Republicans fully expected Johnson to sign it into law. Congress wanted this agency to continue a federal refugee program aimed at protecting and providing shelter and provisions for the displaced slaves as well as trials by military commissions of individuals accused of depriving African Americans of their civil rights. To Congress's surprise, Johnson vetoed the bill and attacked it as race legislation that would encourage a life of what he called wasteful laziness for Southern blacks. Congress passed the bill over Johnson's veto five months later. Johnson also vetoed a landmark Civil Rights Act of 1866. Think about it. It will be another hundred years before Lyndon Baines Johnson and the Great Society. The Civil Rights Act defined as citizens all persons born in the United States except Native Americans. The bill also listed certain rights of citizens, including the right to testify in court, own property, make contracts, and enjoy, and enjoy the, quote, full and equal benefit of all laws and due process accorded to all citizens. It authorized federal officials to bring suit in federal courts rather than state courts for civil rights violations. Johnson tried to strike down the law as a violation of states' rights, expecting his veto to appeal to anti-black sentiment among Northern voters. In April 1866, Congress passed the act over Johnson's veto. This was the first time that Congress had overridden a veto, a presidential veto of major legislation. As tensions grew, Johnson's determination to deny civil rights to African Americans motivated the Joint Committee on Reconstruction to formulate the 14th Amendment. Fearful that the Supreme Court might at some future date rule unconstitutional the Civil Rights Act, Congress passed the far reaching amendment on June 16, 1866. For the first time, U.S. lawmakers defined national citizenship, which authorized the federal government to protect the rights of U.S. citizens. Congress revoked the three-fifths cause of the Constitution and provided for a proportionate decrease in representation 
when a state denied suffrage to any male citizen. Sorry, ladies, you're not there yet, unfortunately, except for those who have participated in rebellion or other crimes. When most Southern states rejected the amendment, the Joint Committee made its acceptance a condition of a state's restoration to the Union. It was in this intense atmosphere that the congressional elections of 1866 loomed extremely large. Southern whites hoped to use the expected popular backlash to Republican militancy to seize control of the House of Representatives and overturn the congressional reconstruction initiatives. Johnson hit the campaign trail, which up until this point was unprecedented. Now, of course, presidents are out there nonstop campaigning, not only for themselves, but for congressmen and senators. So Johnson's what was called swing around the circle, unquote, tour backfired on him, however, as his blatant racism came to the forefront in his personal attacks on his opponents, offending many moderate Democrats and uncommitted voters. When Republicans won two-thirds of both houses, the Joint Committee on Reconstruction passed over Johnson's veto, the Reconstruction Act of March 8, 1867. This act divided the 11 southern states excluding Johnson's home state of Tennessee into five military districts subject to martial law. To be fully restored to the Union, Southern states were required to hold new constitutional conventions elected by universal manhood suffrage. These conventions would then establish state governments to ratify the 14th Amendment and guarantee voting rights for black males. A military governor who was authorized by Congress controlled each district with the power to use military force to protect life and property. Once these provisional governments had fully complied with congressional directives, they might be allowed full status in the Union, but Congress reserved the right to decide each case individually. On March 2, 1867, Congress moved to limit Johnson's powers as president in several ways. The Command of the Army Act instructed the president to issue orders only through the general of the army. Then, at that time, it was U.S. Grant, who could not be removed nor sent outside of the Capitol without Senate permission. Then Congress passed the Tenure of Office Act. On the same day, which prohibited the president from removing certain federal officials without senatorial approval. It did this by specifying that officials appointed with the advice of the Senate were to remain in office until the Senate approved a successor. When Southern whites refused to cooperate in the calling of new constitutional conventions, Congress passed a series of supplementary Reconstruction Acts from March through July of 1867. These new pieces of legislation gave the military commanders broad powers to initiate the calling of the conventions and declare it a, a convention valid if supported by a majority of the votes cast overriding the white boycott. Union commanders were expected to follow congressional policy and not directives from Johnson on this matter. By late 1867, most Southern states held constitutional conventions, and all of them were dominated by a Republican coalition consisting of white Southerners supporting Reconstruction, Northern transplants to the South, and newly enfranchised freedmen. From June 22nd, through June 25, 1868, Congress readmitted seven Southern states, Arkansas, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, North Carolina, and South Carolina, 
they were all readmitted to full status in the Union. Johnson's vetoes of the Reconstruction Acts tried to preempt radical Reconstruction by associating it with vengeance, disunion, and subjugation. He called the congressional program an exercise in, quote, absolute despotism, unquote, that would, quote, Africanize, unquote, the South. He repeatedly claimed that the reunion of North and South would have been easy and certain if only Congress had not defied him. Although he believed he represented the will of the masses of whites in the, in the North, as well as the South, Johnson was out of step with public opinion and Congress easily overrode his vetoes. Thoroughly blocked at every turn, Johnson felt he had no choice but to challenge what he considered to be the usurpation of presidential authority in the Tenure of Office Act. Knowing he risked impeachment, Johnson challenged the act by dismissing Secretary of War Edwin Stanton on August 12, 1867, while Congress was out of session. He named Grant as the interim Secretary of War. When Congress reconvened in December of 1865, Johnson submitted his reasons to the Senate, but the Senate refused to concur with the, with the dismissal of Stanton under provisions of the law. Grant broke from Johnson on this. The crisis flared up again on December 20, or pardon me, on February 21st, 1868, when Johnson dismissed Stanton once again. On the 24th of February, the House voted to impeach Johnson, 126 to 47, without holding hearings first or having specific charges against him. Sound familiar? The House subsequently drew up 11 charges, principally associated with Johnson's alleged violations of the Tenure of Office Act and the Command of the Army Act but also including charges that Johnson brought disgrace and ridicule to the presidency. The managers of the House of Representatives Impeachment Committee presented the articles to the Senate for trial on March 4th. The trial began with opening statements on March 30th, presided over by Chief Justice Chase. Johnson's legal counsel argued that Johnson fired Stanton to test the constitutionality of the Tenure of Office Act and that his action constituted neither a high crime nor a misdemeanor by any sensible definition of the terms. Voting on May 16th, the Senate failed to convict Johnson by one vote of the two thirds necessary by a vote of 35 to 19. Two subsequent ballots on the 26th of May produced the same results. The Senate adjourned as a court of impeachment. Sounds like just what we went through. The impeachment of Johnson, the first of three presidents to be impeached, Johnson, Clinton, Trump. This impeachment involved complicated issues of law, politics, and personalities. At its heart lay the nearly irreparable relations between Johnson and Congress over which agency of government should oversee Reconstruction. This question of competing authority masked a more fundamental issue. Congress had instructed the U.S. Army to implement a policy that the commander-in-chief vehemently opposed. In direct violation of congressional intent and the Command of Army Act, Johnson used the summer of 1867, when Congress was not in session, to remove several military commanders in favor of officers more supportive of white rule in the South. Later, he tried to create what he called an Army of the Atlantic, headquartered in Washington, D.C., as a means of intimidating his opponents in Congress. Seeing that Johnson was using the army to play politics and endangering the lives of soldiers in the field, Grant 
turned against Johnson. The principal issue was Johnson's loss of support within the majority congressional party, the Republican Party. Had the nation been governed by a parliamentary system, which requires a prime minister to have the support of a majority of the legislature, Johnson would have been summarily removed in a vote of no confidence. Almost all Republicans agreed that Johnson was totally unfit for office. They felt Johnson had disgraced the government and the party and abdicated the moral high ground that the Union and Republicans had won in the war. Article 10 of the impeachment charges arraigned Johnson for his, quote, intemperate, inflammatory, and scandalous harangues, unquote, during the 1866 senatorial or, and congressional election tour, the Swing Around the Circle tour. But these were clearly not impeachable offenses. This uncertainty worked in Johnson's favor. Also, because no vice president had been elected after Johnson's ascension to the presidency, his successor would have been Benjamin Wade, president pro tem of the Senate, of the Senate, pardon me, an extreme radical on Reconstruction and a soft money pro labor politician feared by many Northern businessmen. With Wade in the wings, many Johnson opponents were hesitant about voting to convict Johnson, especially those who thought that if Wade assumed the presidency, he might try for the nomination in 1868, blocking Grant. Also, Chief Justice Chase refused to allow deviation from the charges to discuss or include broader issues of policy. Again, sound familiar. We just went through this. In the end, the seven Republicans who voted to acquit, most of them supporters of Grant, were silently supported by their moderate party colleagues. Had these seven not indicated a willingness to acquit, others stood ready to change their votes and convict Johnson. Many Senate Republicans had decided to make it a close vote but not a conviction, especially once it became clear that if Johnson was acquitted, he was prepared to cease his obstructionist ways for the rest of his term and stop his interference with Reconstruction and with military commanders and the War Department. The final vote maintained the principle that Congress should not remove a president from office simply because its members disagreed with him over policy, style, and administration of office. Again, sounds like a replay of what just happened. It did not mean that Johnson retained governing power. For the rest of his term, Johnson was without influence on public policy. Moreover, between his presidency and the turn of the century, a quote-unquote weak presidency system of governance was instituted, one which Woodrow Wilson referred to in the 1870s as congressional government, because after Johnson's collapse, the country was run by congressional committee leaders and cabinet secretaries. So really, it's after Lincoln, the height of presidential power from Lincoln really until Teddy Roosevelt is when Congress takes the power back from the executive. That is where we're going to end today. Next Wednesday, we'll pick up and complete discussion of the Johnson presidency and move into Grant's presidency. Again, tonight at 7 p.m., as a reminder, I will be leading a Facebook Live discussion on the roaring 1920s on Marple Public Library's Facebook page from about, I'll, I'll sign on at about 6.50 p.m., and we should be finished by about 8 or 8.15. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope to see you tonight, and we'll definitely see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m.